Our guests today are Matt Goodman and Scott Croft and partners of Sullivan and Cromwell up in New York City. They're going to talk about mergers of equals. This is all part of our Doing Deals Hot Takes conference. I'm Brock Romanek today on Zippy Point. Mergers of equals, an interesting topic. I've worked in house at Lockheed Martin, which was the conglomerate of 17 different companies. And Martin met Arietta when they merged with Lockheed Corporation. That was sort of a merger of equals. I got to the company right afterwards. And it was interesting to be there in, in part of the culture and see how people always referred themselves to Heritage Lockheed or Heritage Martin Marietta. And I was one of the oddballs that would come in after the deal. It was shortly after the deal. So, you know, it definitely played a big role in how people thought of themselves, even though it was now a merged entity. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Scott, to kick us off and explaining what this is all about. Sure. Thanks, Brock. Um, so at the highest level, when we refer to a mergers of equal deal, what we're referring to is a transaction that typically involves a 100% stock for stock transaction um, involving two similarly sized companies with complementary businesses. Um, they, there, are some, there are some instances where there's a cash component, but it's not typical. Um, and in a true merger of equals, there are often expansive social governance and compensation details that are spelled out in the merger agreement. And we're going to spend some time talking through um, both the financial considerations of what makes mergers of equal unique from that perspective, as well as the governance uh, considerations that are, that are, again, unique to be merger of equal transactions. So with that, Matt, would you like to get into the, the financial considerations? Yeah, and the financial considerations, um, atypical of most uh, of the type of deals we work on, don't actually get a lot of uh, a lot of time spent on them in terms of negotiating, um, you know, uh, callers or mitigating fluctuations in the market risk, um, because there's generally no to low premium deals here. And it's truly a combination, not really one party acquiring the other and each party, because they're in complementary businesses or similar industries, uh, share kind of macroeconomic risks. So you don't have that same, um, you don't have those same issues that you would have in a, in a typical acquisition where you're worried about um, the value uh, dissipating in one versus the other. Um, or even in stock for stock deals where it, where it truly is an acquisition where you have some of those risks. So. Um, th there can be a floating exchange ratio where the ratio shifts to ensure a constant or kind of relatively constant value exchange. But for the reasons I mentioned up top, that's really uncommon for a, an MOE deal. Um, the typical structure is a fixed exchange ratio, right? Because it offers some dilution protection and usually MOEs involve companies, like I said, in similar industries. So the macroeconomic influences and risks aren't really going to impact um, the, the deal certainty in terms of value. Um, callers on the exchange ratio and walk away, walk away rights um, are pretty unusual in a true MOE transaction, but just for, um, for filling out the story, callers are typically structured to provide an upper and lower bounded exchange ratio, uh, limiting the number of shares of the combined company issued uh, within a range. There are sometimes um, walk away rights, which can either be kind of an absolute walk away right if if the um, if the value fluctuates um, below a certain threshold, uh, or conceivably above a, a certain threshold. Um, but often you'll see an added layer, um, and there, those are called double triggers, where the walk away rights uh, only apply in the event of a decline that meets a percentage over and above uh, the decline experienced by Kind of a negotiated basket of peer companies or some industry indices um, that you know, the, the, the companies uh, involved in the MOE are, are part of. So uh, the, the other interesting thing about MOEs, in addition to almost having kind of reciprocal uh, financial terms, is that there are a lot of reciprocal terms uh, in the deals that typically get hotly negotiated in acquisitions. Um, so I'm going to give it back over to Scott to work through some of those. Sure, and I guess I'd just say one additional thing on the financial terms is that the bankers still find things to do. 
often there's a debate as to do you use you know a 20 day VWAP, a 90 day VWAP. If one company has significantly perform, underperformed the other over the last couple of years, they'll argue a pure stock price isn't a fair metric because of the intrinsic value of the company. So the bankers still find things to do on these deals um, besides all the callers and the like they're not talking about, but uh, completely agree. Um, on, on, the, on the terms that Matt referred to, the reciprocal other deal terms, um, it, in some ways, negotiating the merger agreement for a merger of equals is one of the easier negotiations you will face, at least on, the on some of the traditional terms that you negotiate. So when you set up the reps and warranties, if you're the first person, uh, if, you're, if you're the first um, party serving up the initial draft, you're likely going to set those up to be reciprocal. So that each party is making an identical set of reps and, is, and each party is going to be saddled with an identical set of interim operating covenants with the view that what's good for the goose is good for the gander. And so what that leads to is a much a much lighter negotiation of those terms because there isn't one party starting anchoring at nine and the other party coming back at one and working your way towards the middle. You're really trying to come up with something that is fairly middle of the road. Neither set of executives wants to be hamstrung during the sign to close period um, or face hair trigger uh, rep terms. And so on that basis, usually it's a fairly permissive set of covenants and reps. Uh, that, that you serve up. They do serve. They do still serve an important function to to preserve value and to, to, to fill a due diligence function, as well as to ensure no serious um, no serious issues arise between sign and close. But it's just not the same degree of negotiation you face in in uh, non MOE transactions. Um, the the deal protections, however, are still heavily negotiated, even though there is a degree, even though there is often a degree of reciprocity in them. Um, by, by agreeing to a merger of equals, in some sense, both parties have set themselves up and have put themselves in play for an interloping bidder who may not pursue a who may not pursue a merger of equals. As Matt noted, you, typically there's a there's a limited or no premium in these transactions, um, and in our experience, um, that that creates some concern at the at the two companies that that they could become ripe for a takeover. And so there's always the, 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 the deal protections are heavily negotiated. Oftentimes, uh, people are sensitive to the idea they don't want to make it too easy for someone to come in and take away the long term benefits of the deal by offering an upfront premium. And so obviously, within the bounds of Delaware fiduciary duties, people pay very close attention to the, the terms of the deal protections. Uh, the one additional point I'd, I'd like to cover here is just regulatory risk. As I mentioned, often the two businesses are uh, complementary and they don't face uh, direct competition in all areas. But there is, because they're often in similar or the same industries, there is a degree of competitive overlap that needs to be addressed with the regulators. The parties need to come to an agreement as to the degree of regulatory risk that they're willing to take and the commitment they're willing to take to get the deal done, recognizing that in some sense, the parties have put themselves at risk of an interloper by signing up the deal. They do want to make sure that there's a high degree of certainty that they will, they will achieve a deal. Typically, this doesn't rise to the level of an unqualified hell or high water, but it is a significant commitment from both parties to, to uh, do what it takes to get the transaction done. The next topic I'd like to transition over to is just around the, the governance and social uh, social matters that we talked about previously. Um, uh, why don't we start at the top, which would be with board representation. So when I think of a traditional merger of equals, I'm, I'm usually thinking of a 50-50 board split um, in which half of the directors come from one legacy company and the other half of the directors come from the other legacy company. Um, if the deal is, if the MOE is a little bit of a, a, a sort of a a, a, an unequal MOE, there could be an argument as to why one party should have a slightly larger board representation than the other party, but that would need to be counterbalanced by other factors or by supermajority mechanisms to create protections that would get people comfortable around an unbalanced board. Um, there's a there's a famous example in which uh, of the, the Duke uh, Progress Energy transaction in which the day after closing, um, the new board of Duke ousted the uh, ousted the CEO who had been a legacy progress CEO and installed the former Duke CEO, which was viewed as a retrade on the spirit of the MLE. There were no hardwired protections in that transaction. And you can see the results of that transaction now, even several years later, the people often do put in supermajority protections for some key provisions to prevent a situation where 
um, we're in a situation where where if if there's a slight uh, um, if there's a board inequity that that someone could wind up undoing the carefully calibrated MOE terms. Um, so so that's something that people have been sensitive since that deal took place. Um, on the board, there's also the question of the chairman role as well as the um, the lead independent director role. Um, approximately half of the uh, of MOE transactions in recent years designate one party CEO as the as the new CEO of the combined company, with the other party CEO serving as the chairman or executive chairman. But then there's no further specified succession plan. But there are many different flavors to this. Um, in some transactions, the succession plan is locked in, and the parties expressly negotiate and structure structural arrangements to ensure a specific succession plan. So that could be a situation where one party CEO is the CEO of the combined company. And then the other party CEO is chairman, and then they swap positions after a set period. It could be a situation where one party CEO is the CEO for a, for a period and chairman for a period of time, with the other person serving in kind of a, a holding role where they would eventually take over the take over the control of the combined company. Um, and then there are some situations where um, you could have a co-CEO role. That's less common, and there, there are examples of when that's, that's run into trouble, but that, that is an option that people sometimes pursue. Um, and there, there are a lot of different flavors here as to how you can structure it and, and what role you want. But at the end of the day, the question of whether you can pursue a viable merger of equals often depends on these high board and CEO level decisions. Um, you really need to have a, a have a tar have two companies who have similar goals relating to the management of the combined company in order to have a deal that's going to work. If both boards think that their CEO is the right per is the the best CEO in the industry and the right person to run any combined company, there's not going to be a path forward to an M MOE in all likelihood in that scenario. Um, so the Oftentimes, there are situations where if there's a CEO who's closer to retirement and they don't have a natural succession plan in place, that's a natural potential partner for an MOE transaction in which you could bring an industry leading CEO to run the combined business, have a board split that makes sense, um, and solve a succession plan all at the same time. Um, but the, the, the specifics of the situation that are bringing the two companies together will, will dictate these combined company high level management type questions. Um, I mentioned lead independent director before as well. That is often a tool that can be used as something of a balancing mechanism. So there's always a, the, these negotiations are carefully calibrated to try to create, um, create a situation where the two parties both feel like they're getting a fair deal. And by giving a party who may feel like they're getting less of the sort of the, the, the decisions on their side of the ledger, giving the lead independent director role, which could be a quite an important role as a way to balance things out there as well. So oftentimes it would be the party who otherwise felt like they were getting a little less could get the lead independent role in that circumstance. Matt, do you want to talk a little bit about senior management roles? Yeah, so in addition to um, splitting up the board and uh, the CEO positions, companies often uh, want to figure out who will also fill the roles of the senior leadership teams or the senior management teams at the combined company. And we have not really seen the evolution that we've seen with the CEO and board um, structures formally um, and in a granular level being built into transaction documents. Um, these are often negotiated and discussed um, amongst the board and the CEOs themselves once those decisions have been made. Um, but the, the CEO does want to ensure that it's, uh, the CEO and the board does want to ensure that the going forward business is managed by a uh, a, a relatively balanced mix of um, the, the two companies' senior management. You, you'll have you know different scenarios depending on uh, kind of the demographics of the existing management teams at both companies. So, for example, if you have a CFO and GC of of one party that you know is is planning on retiring soon, that makes those decisions a lot easier. But often you'll have the CEOs kind of co-chair a steering committee between signing and closing and figure out who is best suited for each position. Um, that oftentimes you know, can be very smooth, particularly if the CEO and the board level discussions have been um, handled uh, well and everyone's on board. In the transaction that um, you know, was subject to some notable litigation over the fall this past year, Cigna and Anthem, um, not the only reasons this deal fell apart, but there was certainly some issues between the two CEOs uh, 
and some animosity over the, the the decision to have one CEO leave the company going forward, and the steering committee that was supposed to determine who would fill the other you know senior management roles was was fraught with all sorts of uh, of conflict and issues, um, and, and that deal ended up falling apart, and, and that process wasn't as smooth as as one would have hoped for. Uh, for determining what the combined company would look like. And this actually goes to a point that we, you know, we touched upon, not probably expressly, but at least implicitly at the top, is that uh, how you frame any one of these transactions is really important. This, the, the Cigna Anthem transaction was actually more of an acquisition in terms of its features on the ground. So there was a cash component, there was a premium, um, there was asymmetry amongst the board seats. Um, but it was marketed and advertised and communicated as an MOE and set some un unrealistic expectations. Uh, and again, that is not the uh, end all and be all as to why this transaction didn't uh, run smoothly and didn't close um, and, and, and didn't have a successful story uh, for, the, for the two parties um, for the transaction, but uh, it, it did create a, a lot of friction in the transaction, particularly in the interim operating period where the, the wheels started to come off the, uh, the transaction. Um, but at the end of the day, it's really actually helpful to uh, formalize that process, make people feel like it was a fair decision of, of who got what roles, um, and also helps employees understand who they report to um, and, and the leadership at the company and have a clear message uh, for employees as well as a clear message for um, the other consumers constituencies involved. So your business partners, your suppliers, your customers, government uh, regulators who will want to know who they uh, should be looking for uh, in, in terms of uh, feedback and input. So it, it is an, an important process, but you know, as I said, we haven't really seen um, that completely formalized. It's usually left up to, like I said, a steering committee or some sort of outside party coming in doing an evaluation of the senior management teams at both companies. Uh, before we get to some of the kind of quote unquote social, other social issues, Scott, did you wanna add anything into that or, or, or should we just get into the, the other topics? No, why don't we go ahead and jump into the others? Got it. Um, so for, for the, some of the other social um, considerations, the name of the company, which you would not think would be um, such a big issue when you're talking about multi-billion dollar deals. Um, but in fact, this is something that is usually at the top of the agenda for most kind of key issues list or um, outlines of, of what parties will need to discuss uh, when they start up uh, an MOE uh, process discussion. Um, so it, it's rare that you just kind of completely scrap the two names of the existing companies Usually, one usually there'll be a combination of the two, uh, or one one of the company's uh, names will be retained. Uh, for for the situations where the parties think, uh, let's just completely rebrand, that usually is phased in over time and bring in kind of brand consultants to come up with uh, the right mixture of uh, branding elements and um, and leave it up to those experts to figure out what the uh, what the right new name will be, um, but you know th this can be this can be an issue that comes up and gets negotiated somewhat um, contentiously. You know whose name goes first, whose name goes last, etc. Uh, but uh, usually uh, the people figure out the uh, the right answer for those. Um, on the headquarters, um, you know the combined company will usually specify where the going forward headquarters are. Um, you'll sometimes see dual headquarters. Um, but in reality, one of those is a nominal headquarter and, and there is a true um, headquarter at one of the, the, the you know, legacy companies. Um, and you know, the, the other thing to think about here is sometimes some businesses have a long tradition of um, being supported by a local community and the optics and the political uh, response to removing you know, the headquarters from that location may you know, be, be an issue. And so there's some thought to that in making sure that um, the, the, the response from either local government or local communities is, is factored into those decisions. Yeah, and I would say that that, that can be amplified in cross-border MOE transactions where you're, we're talking two different countries where in, in two different regulatory approval regimes for the transaction. 
yeah, really good point. Um, the, the other thing that sometimes comes up from a kind of physical facility or location type of um, discussion is whether there should be, you know, even if not a headquarter for one of the legacy businesses, but, you know, a, uh, a major presence for um, one of the legacy businesses. So, you know, having, you know, the head of R&D being done out of one of the legacy businesses uh, location, even if it's not the headquarter, um, that's often a way of bridging uh, the gap on, on some of these issues to, to give um, the, one of the legacy businesses that's not going to have um, its headquarters maintain a, a, a meaningful physical presence for one of their existing facilities. Some of the other uh, social issues that get negotiated from time to time, um, the state of incorporation or domicile, and, and that goes to some of the local regulatory concerns um, that can come up, uh, as well as making sure that the governance regimes um, going forward are consistent with how the combined company wants to run the company. Uh, employee and labor force retention. Uh, oftentimes there, there can be some commitments to having um, a labor or employee um, force retention in certain locations. So for example, in, in heavy you know, manufacturing businesses, there, there may be um, needs to uh, ensure that you know, labor and um, labor organizations are, are satisfied that the deal won't be disruptive um, to um, uh, to the employment uh, regimes and that the, uh, there's not going to be mass layoffs, et cetera. So that, that is sometimes um, included in the agreement to make sure that um, that, that is not a disruptive aspect of, of the transaction. One thing that we might see going forward as a big issue, um, particularly given uh, the news out there on political contributions um, and the governance uh, interest in um, political contributions is having a treatment of how those are handled at the combined company. Um, that's not something we've seen historically um, as a big issue or something that gets negotiated um, or spelled out in any agreement, but um, I think we'll, we'll keep a lookout to see how this goes, like I said, particularly given the pressure from uh, governance, um, uh, government, governance advocates uh, for how companies treat their political contributions um, going forward. So one thing that we haven't got to yet, which is, is a big component of the negotiations is executive compensation. Um, and, and these can be tricky given that MOEs may or may not trigger change of controls, but I'm gonna turn that over to Scott. Thanks, Matt. Um, and Matt's exactly right. One of the first places that we, we look to uh, conduct diligence when, when, we're, when a, a client comes to us and tells us they're considering an MOE it is a careful read um, of, the, of the benefit plans and the, the severance policies of the two, of the two parties. Um, in a true merger of equals, it's possible that a change of control is triggered for both parties, but it's a very fact-specific analysis. Different plans have different triggers, and different triggers have different meaning, whether it's a single trigger or a double trigger and exactly how the triggers work. Um, and that can create some frictions. Um, you have two executive teams who realize that they're being combined into one larger executive team. There will be some synergies from, from going from two teams into one team. Um, and uh, there's a sense of, there's a desire to create a, what, what I would consider a level playing field around the treatment of executives in the event the transaction happens. So if the, if the two plans and em employment arrangements are not naturally harmonized, that there's sometimes a desire to pull levers and figure out a way to come to a harmonized approach to, to CIC treatment for both parties. Um, oftentimes that comes in the form of, Agreeing that the transaction would be a um, would would constitute a CIC trigger, but that would be subject to double trigger vesting in the event of a qualifying termination after the closing. Um, but working through that is important, and giving a degree of comfort to senior executive teams who are likely highly marketable, um, and giving them comfort around their their role in a go forward com uh, uh, company or their comfort around their compensation in the event they were to no longer move forward is an important component to keeping stability during the time between the time you start negotiating the transaction and the time that you ultimately close the transaction. 
Um, it's also common for the combined company to grant some form of a reload or integration award to senior management to help motivate them in achieving the desired synergies. Um, this is an area where we spend a lot of time working through MOEs and coming up with a, with a plan that we think um, is fair to the shareholders and is fair to the management teams um, and will keep the management teams motivated as we move forward in the transaction. Um, so that, that's the executive compensation piece of this in a nutshell. Um, I think just to conclude, we've talked through a lot of the key deal points. We'd like to just talk more holistically a little bit about what we view as the keys to a successful merger of equals. Um, and one of those isn't something you're going to see in the legal documents, but it's really a cultural integration question of, of and creating a, a culture in which there's a feeling that you're working for one combined company, but it's not going to be an environment in which there are the red shirts and the blue shirts on the teams going forward um, after, after the deal closes, but rather one in which the, the company is, is working together towards its combined goals. Um, and the, coming up with the right calibration for that is important. Some of that plays through what we talked about at the top of this discussion and, and through the different mechanisms of developing a combined management team and building a best of breed, um, uh, best of breed company when you combine the two. Um, and, and coming up with the right balance, there's no one right solution for that. These are very politically sensitive. Um, they're sensitive to the people who are involved in negotiating them. Um, they need to be carefully cal calibrated and the discussions that take place between the parties need to be carefully calibrated as well. That there is always a sense to some extent that each party believes in the in the way they've been operating their business so that obviously that their business their business model should be the go forward there needs to be a recognition that both parties are bringing important attributes and values to the equation and that the combined company can truly be stronger than either of them individually but additionally there is always the important role of identification of synergies. That's both cross-selling opportunities as well as uh, cost synergies. Oftentimes you'll need to get consultants involved. So that can be done in a, in a clean fashion without creating antitrust issues. But that synergies analysis is a key component of any MOE transaction and figuring out what the value is here to combining the two businesses. Um, and, and that can also come in the form of facility consolidation and figuring out how do we build the best individual company uh, individual combined company on a go forward basis. Um, and, and then there's a key component there that ties to uh, the, the, um, the communication strategy going forward. Matt, do you wanna share a little about communication strategy? I, I just wanted to touch upon something on the facility consolidation point, which I, I, I don't know if we have an answer to this yet, but it'll be interesting going forward in terms of how the world uh, responds to post COVID with working remotely and whether um, you know, whether it will be an opportunity to reduce physical um, facilities and locations and, and how that will factor in going forward. Um, but one, one of the key, one of the key uh, things in terms of whether people will view um, an, an MOE transaction as successful is right from the beginning messaging and getting the communication strategy right with all the core constituencies, not just the marketplace um, from a shareholder perspective, but a customer supplier communication strategies need to really be well thought out in advance, um, as well as kind of local communities, the uh, labor force, et cetera. Um, you know, getting the messaging right from the beginning really sets you up to have a potentially successful transaction. Thinking about it last minute or having a couple missteps in the communications kind of put you on your back foot um, and then make your actual integration planning um, and execution of your integration planning that much more difficult. Um, that, that was what we had in terms of um, kind of core and key considerations for MOEs. So I think we're turning it back over to you, Brock. Yeah, it's interesting how remote working will play into this because like in the Lockheed Martin Marietta case, the headquarters were on different coasts. So the fact that Bethesda was chosen as a headquarters and that's where Martin Marietta was means that the MLE was really tilted towards Martin Marietta. It's inevitable because a lot of people didn't want to relocate from the West Coast. But now with the ability to re re work remotely, you know, much more easily, that might be solved. On the other hand, working remotely, I think, slows down the process of true integration of culture because you don't have all those soft, you know, collegial moments where you're having ice cream and cake for someone's birthday, all those small things that really play a large role in building true relationships among 
uh, colleagues. So it, it'll be interesting to see how it all works out. So we're taping this as the uh, brackets have just been announced for the March Madness. Matt and I are rooting for Michigan. Scott's rooting for Michigan State. Uh, the Big Ten sure should do well, we would think, but uh, you never know. We'll see how it goes. As long as Ohio State does it when it's okay. Exactly. We can all agree to that. <laughs> Great job, guys. Thanks very much. Thank you.